Hey, it's Kai. Before we get into the last episode of this season of Blind Spot, I hope you'll take a minute to reflect back on the series. Have you been moved by the stories you heard? Did the series help you think about HIV and AIDS differently? Did you learn something you didn't know? First off, if you can answer any of those questions, we want to hear from you. Email us at blindspot at wnyc.org to let us know what's on your mind. Second, the team here at WNYC Studios worked four months to bring you the episodes you heard in this season. We talked with community activists, doctors, scientists, social workers, just anyone we could find to hear their stories about how this disease unfolded in our communities. We visited archives to hear old interviews and find log reports of people who have long ago died. It takes a lot of people, time, and resources to bring you this kind of journalism. For us here at WNYC Studios, one of the major sources of funding for that work comes from you. So if you have found value in what you heard and you're in a place to help, please let us know by supporting us with a contribution. To donate, go to wnycstudios.org slash blindspot and click on support us. It's quick and easy, and it will really make a difference in helping us continue to bring you reporting that bears witness and tell stories that may otherwise be forgotten. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. So when I was in seventh grade, there was an AIDS assembly at my school. I remember walking to school that day and being like really nervous and being like, what's going to (laughs) happen? Kia Michelle Binbo was born in 1990 in New York City. Her mother and father found out they were HIV positive three years later. Then they had Kia tested. I knew that I was HIV positive since I was very, very young. Um, And even though I didn't really know what it meant, I knew that I had it. And her mom started speaking out. She was somebody that wanted to have a voice, especially as being, she was a mixed Filipino woman, you know, in Asian communities is very like, you know, like Asian people, we don't, we don't get AIDS. We're not like a part of that. Kia's mom didn't want her to carry that kind of shame. She taught her daughter to be matter of fact about her HIV status, at least at home. But nobody at school actually knew about Kia's status. So then that day, in seventh grade, when Kia walked into this school assembly, she discovered it was being led by one of her mom's friends, an activist. Who was, I knew throughout my whole childhood. And so for me, I was like, oh my God, it's Dot! I was like really excited and I felt really comfortable. And it was like this like amazing moment. And he did like a kind of survey of the room. If you know someone who is Asian, stand up. And so, like, everybody mostly stands up. You know, if you someone who know someone who's gay, stand up. If you know someone who's Asian and gay, and he's describing himself at this point. By the time he got to, like, do you know anyone who's Asian and gay and HIV positive? It was, like, very, not a lot of people. And then he just asked the question, like, is anyone HIV positive? And I just naturally stood up. And I got up, and I was the only one standing up. And I immediately sat down, and I was like, what did I just do? And I started sobbing, and everyone in my class is looking at me, like, freaking out. And I was, like, terrified, because I was like, fuck. Um, I wonder how people are going to treat me now. But it was nothing but love. And after that, like, people knew me. Did it feel like a relief at all? It did. It felt like a big weight off of my shoulders. Do you remember telling your mother about? Yes. I called her and I told her, and she was so proud of me. She was like, you go, girl. She was just so excited and elated and proud. And my dad, on the other hand, was like, don't ever do that again. I don't know if she mentioned it. I definitely mentioned it, and you were definitely freaking out about it. Oh, no, I don't remember. See, there are things that I don't want to remember because they hurt my heart. So I just keep them out of my mind. And usually they come up in uh, what's called the dark night of the soul, which is when you get into the bed 
to go to sleep, and all these thoughts come up, and you can't do anything about them because you're in the bed. When Kia's dad, Warren Binbo, told people he was HIV positive, he did not have that same welcoming experience as Kia. It was 1993. Worst thing I ever did. I told people, I called people. People would cross the street if I was walking down the street. People who I knew or thought I knew would stop communicating with me. A lot of people that I told in the beginning, they've forgotten because I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just leave it at that. And no one, no one that I know knows anymore. I mean, you know, my friends know a couple of them. I know it's a very difficult thing to talk about and to think about, but... Well, I won't be talking about this or thinking about this after this podcast. You know, I'll just put it back in the, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, and and, uh, I won't, won't remember. This is Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. Stories from the early days of AIDS and the people who refused to stay out of sight. I'm Kai Wright. The debate that Warren and Kia are having about whether and how they talk about their HIV status today is possible because they lived long enough to get treatment. They made it to that remarkable moment in June of 1995 when the FDA approved a new kind of drug that changed everything. One year later, the number of people diagnosed with AIDS in the United States declined for the very first time. And a year after that, death rates plummeted by 47%. It was a climactic moment of victory for science. But science alone will never end this epidemic. In this final episode of our series, Lizzie Ratner, our lead reporter, and myself... We're going to sit with Kia and other people living with HIV and AIDS today who, despite their pain, their ambivalence, their frustrations, and their own desires to just be done with it, realize they can't be done with it. They're telling us none of this is over. And there is still so much to bring out of the shadows. It's been a really long time. 20 years since my mom died. And not even just since she died, but since I had a conversation with her, since I held her, since I heard her laugh, you know? (laughs) Smile, smile, all right. Unlike her dad, Kia is someone who's keeping alive her family's shared history with HIV and AIDS through her work as an artist. Her professional name is Kia LaBeja. She's an image maker a photographer, and a performer who has spent much of her life telling very personal stories. <gasps> hey. Kia can still watch her mom on old videotapes she has. She's young, just a baby, a little over one, but her mom is singing and playing and reading books. Uh-oh, it's Let's Go All Around the Neighborhood. Oh, boy, we read that one a million times. She was born in Subic Bay in the Philippines on March 11th. 1957, and she passed here in Manhattan at Roosevelt Hospital uh, October 19th, 2004. Quan Bennett, yeah, she was 47, 46, 47, can't remember. Kia's entire family had made it to the medical victory of the late 1990s. But by the early aughts, the euphoria of that victory had begun to fade For some, the treatment that could save your life also proved difficult. The drugs were hard on the body. There were side effects. Back then, there was, like, a lot of pills you had to take. And you had to take them in the morning, and you had to take them at night. For me, I always felt the side effects. So nausea, fatigue, headache. Having to take those medications every day, especially when you're at that age, is really, really hard to do because you don't want to do anything at that age. You're just like, I just want to do my thing. I was doing all types of shit, like flushing them pills down the toilet and be like, I took them. And then you're not really taking them. Um, Yeah, it sucked. 
And that was the deal with your mom. If she would have just stayed on those pills, she would only have to take one a day now. Instead of what? Maybe she was taking four or something like that, or not taking four. But they were all in the cabinet. They were all in the, in the drawer. And it was, uh, it was upsetting, you know. The virus, for me, is under control because I take these medicines and... Um, well, actually, it's only one medicine. One pill once a day. That's something. Yeah. Because treatment science didn't stop. It kept advancing, finding new ways to limit the side effects, to reduce the number of pills you got to choke down. But the year Kia's mom died in 2004, one in four people living with HIV in the U.S. were, for one reason or another, unable to stay on treatment. Some of that was about the drugs themselves. They didn't work or they just took too much of a toll. And some of it, it is harder to understand. I think a lot of people in my family, there was a lot of kind of, not blame or shame, but this feeling of like, oh, she should have just, and I'm like, no, that was her choice. And for me, like, I'm the closest person to her, so... Nobody has more shit to say than I do. Where's your butt? Where's your butt? Butt. <laughs> Very good, Kia. And um, I love her regardless. Like, and I miss her to death. And I wish she could be here to see that one pill once a day. But she's not, and there's nothing we can do about that, except still love her. You know. She lived the life she wanted to live, and she made a choice. And I need everyone to respect that choice. I have tried to respect this choice. Someone I loved also decided he did not want to take the drugs that suppress the virus. And that was a difficult choice to grasp. But I know this. People who lived through the worst of this were scarred in ways most of us cannot imagine. I would say that there was not a single day that went by when there was not someone that I knew who was not dying, diagnosed, or in the hospital. Phil Wilson has lived with HIV since 1981, the very beginning of the epidemic. He began to pour his grief into activism in the mid-1980s and never stopped. Along the way, he buried his lover and countless friends. And now in his late 60s, he's finally begun reflecting on the mark it's all left on him. When I talk about HIV and aging, and for those of us who you know are at that point in our lives, I talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, post-traumatic stress syndrome you know, is developed from primarily the Vietnam War, or you know, young men going off to war. But if you think about that, in that scenario, people are in the battle theater usually for a tour is like a year long. Now people do multiple tours, but but one tour is like a year long. For those of us who were in the HIV pandemic battle, that tour lasted for, you know, what, 30 years? How like 20 years? That, how do you think that changed you, Phil? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, you had, have developed this reputation, you know, as somebody who's so tenacious, would stop at nothing. And so we talk about those things heroically, right? But I wonder about the other side of that. I never experienced it heroically, and I'll just be honest in answering your question. It was because I we were too afraid to stop, that if we slowed down, that we would just, you know, die. Phil's refusal to stop made a difference particularly in convincing influential allies in the Black community to join the fight against AIDS. That's where he put his trauma until he could face it. 
Kia faced hers by making art. Just two years after her mom died, when she was 16 years old, Kia returned to the same hospital where her mom had gone many times when she was sick and where she ultimately died. She wanted to remember what happened there, and she had an idea. She would document the time. I had like a little Nikon power shoot camera, and I started taking photographs of the hospital. Um, I took a picture of the first room that I saw her with the, like, intubated. And I did it very, like, on the low. Um, but the security guard knew me forever, so he just let me upstairs. He was just like, yeah, you can go upstairs. I was like, cool. And for me, like, it was more than just a hospital wing or a floor. There was just, there was something almost nostalgic and something almost happy. You know, to be like, oh, yeah, I hung out with my mom here. Oh, yeah, I hung out with my dad here. You know what? We were all together here. There was love here, regardless. I think that's the first time that I really understood the power of, like, what an image could do for you personally. I wasn't thinking about art or... Nothing like that. I just was kind of like, okay, I'm going to hold on to this. Since then, Kia has shown work at the Museum of the City of New York, the Whitney, at the Tate Modern in London. She had a solo show in New York two years ago. For a while, when I first started making it and I first started talking about it, I started to get tired, and I started having that feeling of, like, ah, the story, it's a story. It's not my life, it's a story. Like, oh, my God, when you Google my name, it says, like, Kia LaBeja, HIV, you know? And seeing that was, like, it felt icky to me. And then I had a point where I was like, I'm going to push it away. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to make work about it. But now I'm like, no, I should be proud, and I shouldn't feel ashamed of it, and I don't have to be scared of it, um, even though I am sometimes. For Kia, telling the story is a way of owning it. Through her storytelling, this podcast included, she reminds the rest of us that she is who she is, in part because of HIV. Coming up, what it can really mean to carry the weight of the virus, both in someone's body and in our collective spirit. You're listening to Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. I bet you my whistle should come up with Valerie Reyes Jimenez, the most positive woman we spoke to in our very first episode. She became a positive woman. <laughs> she spent more than 30 years fighting stigma as an AIDS activist and just by living out loud about her own HIV status the whole time. Just a month before her husband died, in 1992, they were profiled in El Diario La Prensa, which was then the largest Spanish-language newspaper in New York. They came out as a young, HIV-positive Puerto Rican couple. And after he died, Valerie took the article. I printed out, like, I don't know, 500 copies or something, and I put that in the funeral parlor instead of those little cards that say, you know, like, sunrise, sunset, born, died. I just decided to use that opportunity to to put it out there that, no, he didn't die from cancer or anything like that. And, and at the same time, I was letting people in the community know that I was a survivor. Valerie's continued speaking out all these years, including candid talk about how hard that living has been on her body. The aging process is in kind to anyone, when, even when you're healthy. But um, when you have the virus in there, that prickly little, mean little virus in your body doing what viruses do, I just really believe that it, it does accelerate the normal aging process. I will tell you that my bones are jacked up. I've got bones, spurs, 
upon bone spurs. My mom is 18 years older than I am, but I have caught up to her already as far as like where I'm at with my my body stuff. So my arms are fairly thin. My legs are pretty thin, but this area from like my neck on down to my pelvis is pretty thick, like this thick fat. I feel like I'm walking around with a 20 pound bag of rice on my chest. I feel like I'm hugging it really tight. That's exactly what it feels like. But that big old bag of rice does nothing to dampen Valerie's voice. It's all right to be HIV positive. There's nothing wrong with being HIV positive. Um, Your neighbor could be HIV positive. I can be your friend and be HIV positive. As a matter of fact, I am your friend. Aren't we friends? I'm HIV positive. We're not having enough conversations. We're, We're not getting enough of it. We first talked to Victor Reyes because he was born at Harlem Hospital. He got treatment at Harlem throughout his childhood. 35 years later, Victor is the director of an after-school program at a grade school in Washington, D.C. He also does research at the Global Community Health Lab at Howard University. He wants to keep people thinking and talking about HIV, which he says is just hard still. There seems to be a lull. Doesn't seem like the conversation has grown since the start of the HIV um, epidemic. And, you know, if people are still dying from HIV, then that's that's a problem. Victor has a son now who's under a year old, and he's not sure what he'll tell this kid about his own story of HIV and AIDS. On one hand, he doesn't want to pass the pain and fear on to yet another generation. I mean, the goal has always been growing up to, if I ever got to this point, to give my child a better life than I had. And I don't know, I don't I don't know if I want to put fear. I haven't thought about it enough, but I definitely want to educate him. And yet, Victor also knows that one thing all the miracle science in the world can't erase is stigma. And until that part is solved too, some piece of this epidemic will remain. To me, stigma makes people hide. It prevents people from seeking help, seeking support. It destroys self-esteem. How have you dealt with stigma? Uh, Some of the conversations we've had revolves around innocence and guilty. You know, uh, if you were born with it, you must have been then innocent because you didn't get it behaviorally. And if you got behaviorally, then you must be guilty of something. And that in itself creates a division within people in the HIV umbrella. As an example for my wedding, my brother-in-law officiated our wedding and he showed me what he wrote and I thought it was perfect. The one edit I had on it, and I was disclosing, he wanted to, uh, I said, I don't mind disclosing. And the only edit was that he started it with saying, when I found out Victor was HIV positive, and my only edit was, when I found out Victor was born HIV positive. So I felt the need instinctively to protect myself and to let it be known that I was this quote-unquote innocent person that acquired it prenatally, and so this is who I am. That is even the stigma that I go through, and that exists, right? And I can honestly say that I don't know if I can change that, because believe that when I disclose, then the next question is, oh, how do you get it? Well, does it matter? There is no innocent, there is no guilty. Um, It's just the experience and how you support that person after that. You know, have the conversation shift from how did you get it to just how can I help you? I 
I told you in our very first episode that HIV and AIDS is a social disease as much as a medical condition. We saw this epidemic way too late, and we stopped seeing it way too soon. We chose to look the other way, to wear blinders, so we did not have to pay attention to what was happening. What are you going to do with this? Or what do you hope will happen from it? Margaret Haggerty, the woman who had spent two decades in charge of pediatrics at Harlem Hospital, asked me this question early in our reporting. And I tried to answer her. I talked about what it feels like when I hear people say AIDS is over. And it just pissed me off. I can imagine that would piss me off, too. But I think I know how I would answer her more directly now. I want people to hear these stories because there are nearly 40 million people living with HIV in the world today. There are more than a million new infections every year. And still, 630,000 people died of AIDS globally in 2022. Every single one of those deaths and every single new infection is now preventable. That one pill a day that Kia and Warren talk about, we now know that if everybody with HIV could take that pill, it would suppress the virus in their system to the point that it is literally undetectable. Whatever else might kill them, it will not be HIV. Moreover, when the virus is undetectable, we now know it cannot be transmitted to another person. Science has done its job. HIV is, in some ways, just like any number of other health problems now. And that's just it. Heart disease, diabetes, COVID. The people who continue to needlessly struggle with and die from these and other illnesses, that's not only a medical challenge. It's a social one. We still choose, as a society, to allow HIV to exist. Um, hi, this is Kia LeBeche at WNYC, and I'm talking to my father, Warren Benbo. I, I sound pretty good, huh, Dad? Yeah, pretty. <laughs> um, it is important to also... For people to understand me, it wasn't just like I had one parent in the hospital. I had two parents in the hospital, sometimes at the same time. I think I was the most, uh, I was in the hospital more than anybody else. And mm -hmm. it's not really a lot of fun. And because you don't know if you're going to come out. Kia was 14 when her mom died. My brother describes Christmas as the saddest Christmas <laughs> of all time. Because me and my dad were just like... It was devastating. It's, it's like I'm losing my mom, my dad's losing this one that he loves, and we're both trying to figure out how to deal with that, but also how to deal with each other, which was not easy, because we were both grieving. All right. I want to take a picture of you, Dad, because this is a good angle. If you'll let me take your picture. Okay. Got to got to get you with your your headphones with the WNYC. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you just take it with the cell phone? Because I want to take it with my real camera. Oh. My colleague Lizzie Ratner told Kia about a cemetery, a small island off the Bronx that's said to be the largest AIDS burial ground in the United okay. States. Died of AIDS. So the person who oversaw Hart Island at the time, who actually was... Technically, it is in New York City, but it's not easy to get to. It's the largest public cemetery in the United States. Over a million people are buried there. And it's where the dead are sent when they are unclaimed or unidentified or just can't afford a private burial. It's the city's potter's field. Almost all in mass graves. graves. Oh, wow. Yeah. Can you go there? Uh, happy New Year to everyone. Uh, this marks our first trip over to Heart Island, and it's cold. So, okay. Heart Island sits less than a mile off the edge of the Bronx. 
Four days a week, this ferry takes trucks from the city's morgues. And twice a month, loved ones can visit. Oh, we hope that this trip brings some closure. Lizzie and Kia are on one of those trips. And we're off. Kia came to take photos of a woman who's come here to visit her mother's grave. Today I said I'm going to bring a picture so everyone can see her. Let me put this in. My mama, my queen. Hi, oh my beauty. God, she's beautiful. And she, she looks, looks so like much you. like her. <laughs> wow. This is one of those yeah. pictures from Lizette Rivera is holding a snapshot of her mom, Zeta. Zeta's hair is pulled back. She's smiling and looks happy. I remember uh, her always doing her best. Even being so young, I remember always having clean clothes. I remember always going to school. Lizette says her mom contracted HIV so long ago, there wasn't an AIDS test then. She did have a drug addiction. I would see the needles and stuff around the house. The cause of death was pneumonia. She is in a mass grave with about 150 other bodies. My mom is on top, I know that. Okay, yeah. So and they say her you. feet are here and then her head this way. So you think your mom is just right here? Yes. Grass grows on top of the graves. They look like fields. A single white marker indicates where each trench begins. It's beautiful and it's serene. Now it's nice and open. Uh, there are lots of trees. Um, we're surrounded by water. Sometimes Lizette brings her mother's favorite candies. Once she brought perfume. She tapes her mom's photo to the grave marker. Hey, I have to take a picture too. Oh, I love that. I really appreciate you coming out to spend time with me and mine. Oh, I love you, Mama. I want to just, like, lay out and just... <laughs> she was so strong. Mm -hmm. So strong. I miss you, Mom. I love you every day. You mind if I um, yeah, take a few taking, more yeah. pictures? Is that okay with you? I've been doing a lot of work about my experience growing up with HIV and losing my mom to AIDS. I had no idea that we had that in common. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Me too. I think a lot of people, when they think about, like, grave sites or, you know, where their loved ones are buried or graveyards. I think, you know, some people have this idea that it has a certain level of spookiness. But I always find these places to be very calm, you know, because it's where people are resting. Mm. And especially today, none of us really get enough rest. So to be able to be amongst those that, you know, have had these whole lifetimes before us, you know, and who are our ancestors and our loved ones and our guides, you know, it feels like the best place to, like, take a breath. Breathe and remember... Remember who and what we have all lost to HIV, yes. But also remember the spirit that some among us brought to life. Something Kia said when she returned to her mother's hospital room sticks with me. There was love here. Amid all the horror of the AIDS epidemic, some individuals managed to find that love within themselves. The staff at Harlem Hospital... Joyce Rivera in the South Bronx, Katrina Haslett inside a state prison. The people we have met throughout this series, they each found love and they used it to ease some part of the pain for their communities. They gave of themselves and they made a difference, often with little or no recognition. May we all learn from their brave leadership.
Kia LaBeja took photos of many of the people in our series. To see those photos, go to blindspotpodcast.org. And her dad, Warren Binbo, played drums on our original music. Blindspot, The Plague in the Shadows is a co-production of the History Channel and WNYC Studios in collaboration with The Nation magazine. Our team includes Emily Botin, Karen Frillman, Anna Gonzalez, Sophie Hurwitz, Lizzie Ratner, Christian Reedy, and myself, Kai Wright. Our advisors are Amanda Aronchik, Howard Gertler, Jenny Lawton, Marianne McCune, Daruba Richin, and Linda Villarosa. Music and sound design by Jared Paul. Additional music by Isaac Jones. And additional engineering by Mike Kutchman. Our executive producers at the History Channel are Jesse Katz, Eli Lehrer, and Mike Stiller. Thanks to Miriam Barnard, Lauren Cooperman, Andy Lancet, and Kenya Young. This series would not have happened without the help of many people, including Mike Berry, Robin Billenkoff, Alan Black, John Campbell, Vanessa Servini, Raymond Chan, Tali Chazan, Jacqueline Sincata, Aaron Cohen, Mary Croak, Rex Stone, Andrea Duncan Mao, Javit Ellis, Ricardo Fernandez, Dan Fischette, Lindsay Foster Thomas, Melissa Frank, Stephen Gangaram, David Gable, Emma Gordon, Caitlin Graff, Molly Hindenburg, Jason Isaac, Whitney Jones, Jennifer Houlihan Roussel, Melanie Shu, Kalalia, David Krasnow, Theodora Kusla, Andrea Latimer, Kareem Lawrence, Andre Robert Lee, May Lee, Rachel Lieberman, Casey Means, Christina Newman Scott, Kim Nowaki, Bill O'Neill, Joe Plord, Ann O'Malley, Maya Passini Chanel, Caitlin Quigley, Amy Pearl, Katya Rogers, Megan Ryan, Jennifer Sindro, Wayne Schulmeister, Tara Sonin, Bhaskar Sankara, Irene Trudell, Liz Weber, George Wellington, Christopher Wirth, Ryan Andrew Wild, Lillian Shu, and Ivan Zimmerman. Thanks to you all. And again, we would love to hear from you. Email us at blindspot at wnyc.org to give us your feedback on the series. I'm Kai Wright. You can also find me hosting Notes from America live on public radio stations each Sunday, or check us out wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for listening. <laughs> 